Turn with me to Psalm chapter 19. Psalm chapter 19. One of the problems that we face in this world today is the problem of unbelief. The problem, however, as I have said on other occasions, is not an intellectual problem, it's a moral problem. And I'm going to try to demonstrate from this passage that it's not a moral problem outside of God's word book. It's a moral problem even relative to God's world book. Because the psalmist here makes profound statements with regard to the power of God's creation, the majesty of God's creation, the wonder of God's creation, for man to look at and to see his powerful hand. Read with me beginning in verses 1 through 4. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Some passages mention the heavens, the stars declare the glory of God. In Psalm chapter 8, Verse 3, David will say, when I consider the heavens, the work of your finger, the moon, the stars, which you have ordained. I think David is out, is here, uh, out perhaps in the pasture, uh, watching the sheep at night and, and looking up at the sheep. I'm looking up at the stars. And as he looks up at the stars, he just considers, he just considers God. And when he considers God, he comes down to verse 9 and says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Put that with Psalm 19 when he says, The heavens declare the glory of God. What we hear here, what we see here, is the sermon of from the stars. And that's what David is referring to in Psalm chapter 8. Have have you ever heard the sermon from the stars? Look at Psalm 148. Look at Psalm 148. Listen to what he will say in verse 2. Well, verse 1 begins, Praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise him, all angels. Praise him, all hosts. Praise him, sun, moon. Praise him, all you stars of light. Praise you, heaven of heavens, and you waters above the heavens. What are the stars doing? The stars are praising God. You know today with our advanced technology, they have telescopes that can reach out to the stars to see the brightness of the stars And some have said to hear the stars. Here David is talking about the sermon of the stars. The stars declare declare what? The glory of God. When we look up into the heavens, we see the glory of God. And the stars tell us about his glory. The stars also tell us about his greatness. In Genesis chapter 1, when it talks about the firmament, separating the two seas, the firmament above and the seas below. That expression firmament means means expansion. It's expanding. Look at Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. Look at verse 37. Thus says the Lord, if heaven Above can be measured, and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath. I will also cast off all the seed of Israel, for all they've done, says the Lord. When he says, if the heavens, what he's saying is the heavens can't be measured. And yet there have been attempts to measure the heavens. 
In our Milky Way galaxy, I'm told by Google that it is 100,000 light years in diameter. I don't understand light years, and I don't understand 100,000. And so I have no way to illustrate that for you. But our galaxy also, I'm told, contains one billion stars and there's one trillion galaxies. Now, how'd that happen? Turn back to the Psalms again. Look at Psalm 33. Psalm 33. And look at verse 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. The psalmist here is referring back to the scene in Genesis chapter 1 when the Lord spoke and in seven days all was created. What you see is you see the greatness of God. But in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, we see by creation the power of God. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, Paul will say that the Gentiles are without excuse because by seeing all that is created, we see his power and we see his intelligence and when we think about his power we think about God is the God's the endless source of power he's the one that animates everything and once again I'm told that the sun is 93 million miles from the earth and just one solar flare is equivalent to 100 hydrogen bombs well if you want to know what one hydrogen bomb did just go back and look at what happened to Okinawa and Hiroshima. And you put that with a hundred hydrogen bombs. And the other thing is God set the sun in space and gave it its energy and it will not run out of energy until God calls everything to an end. God gave it its endless source of power. When you see the power of the sun, you see his power. But then we also see we see the grace of God in his creation. For this, we go back to Genesis chapter 1 and on day 6, when God created man. Man was the pinnacle of all that God created. On day 6, he created man, breathed into life the breath of man. That same breath of life that gave the word now gives life into man. And set man in that garden. And in that garden, everything was perfect for him. And yet, Man sinned. Man ruined it. Some have said, well, what we need to do to correct our problems today is we just need to change our environment. Well, since I've already stuck my neck out on the land before, I'll stick it out a little bit further. Our social issues today are not going to be solved because we change our environment. Because our social issues today do not have at their root inequities that grow out of society. I'm not denying there are inequities in society. I will not defend those that are aberrant and those that are absolutely the wrong. But the reason we have inequities in society today is not because of our environment. It's because of the hearts of people. And if we change the hearts of people, we'll change the world. That's why the apostles were said to turn the world upside down. It's not because they put a chicken in every pot, had two car garages in every house, with two BMWs sitting there with four high def TVs in every room, and DVR on demand. We can do that and it's still not going to change man. We can change the Constitution of the United States that is not infallible. It's not God's word. It was made by fallible men and it's still not going to change our environment. Why? Because man's problem, as Adam shows us, in a perfect environment was not his environment. He had perfect environment. There's no weeds, there's no thistles, there's no thorns. Woman is giving birth to child but not in pain. There's no snakes crawling on the ground. Everything there is perfect. And man sins. Why? Because his heart was turned. And when we can take the gospel and turn people's hearts back to the Lord, we'll have the remedy that God put in place when man sinned. 
When man sinned, the remedy for man, God began to institute immediately because in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, he said, here's what's going to happen. The time is going to come when that serpent is going to brew the heel of the seed of woman, but the seed of woman is going to crush his head. He was telling them about what's going to happen and how this is all going to play out. God's grace created man and put man in that perfect environment. But man sinned and man ruined, but God was equal to the challenge. God was not going to let man that was created in his image escape. He was going to do all he could to try to restore man to his image. And from that moment on in human history, all is about bringing the Savior so man could have the opportunity to be saved and have his image changed back into the image of the Lord. In creation, we see God's grace. Some have just said, as well, the people in this time, they were just ignoramuses. They really were not educated. They really didn't know anything. But think about this just a moment. Adam was created fully mature. 24 hours after Adam is created, if you go to Adam and ask him, Adam, how old are you? I'm 24 hours old. Wait 30 days longer. Adam, how old are you? I'm 30 days old. And yet here's Adam. You have Cain, you have Seth, you have inventions of war, inventions of musical instruments, inventions of buildings, inventions of nations. And for 900 years, save God and Jesus himself, Adam is the smartest man on the earth. For 900 years, people could come and ask Adam, tell me about where you came from. And Adam could give them 900 years of perspective. Adam could tell them all about that. And then we think about the power of God's creation testifying to his greatness and to his power and to his glory. And we think about the human body. You think about the resilience of the human body. How is it that it can be racked with a disease called cancer and yet it fights it and fights it and fights it and fights it? And you know, I used to think about that. Just from the book of Ricky here for a moment. I used to think about that, that cancer was relentless and it was so cruel because it would get the patient up to the point of death and then would not let go. And then it dawned on me, that's not what's happening. That person who is struggling with life and cancer taking their life, the body is fearfully and wonderfully made and it is fighting for the very life that God put in it. And what it's saying is, I'm not going to let you have it. It's fighting for every breath. The diseases that we have, and yet how many can live successfully and good functioning life, even in the presence of all the diseases, but that's a side. I want to take just one element of the body, and that's the brain. The most marvelous all of God created us, the brain. I'm told that to have, for man to make the equivalent of the brain would take a building 10 times the size of the entire state building to house it would take all the water of Niagara Falls, all the power of the water of Niagara Falls to power it and that same body of water to cool it. And you know what would happen at the end of that? It couldn't decide whether it was going to make waffles or pancakes in the morning. You think about all the electrons, all the electronics that go into that, And that's housed in our skull. It's called the brain. In the morning, you can decide whether you want waffles or pancakes. You can decide whether you want to wear a mask or not a mask. That machine can't decide that. That's the human brain. You see, when you look at the stars, they preach a sermon. They praise God. They tell about his glory. They tell about his greatness. They tell about his power. Man declares the grace of God, and man also declares the the infinite wisdom of God. You see, when we look at creation, creation is a revelation of God, and that's why he will say, continuing on in Psalm chapter 19, in verses 4, 5, and 6, uh, 5, 6, and 7, he will say, verse 4, the line has gone out through all the earth, their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and he rejoices like a strong man to run its race. It's rising from one end of heaven 
and it circuited the other end of heaven, and there's nothing, nothing hidden from its heat. Did you get that? The line, that is, the measurement of the earth goes out. You can't measure that through all the earth. And their words, what words? The words of the firmament, the words of the stars, the words of all that God had created, they go out to the end of the world and they testify to God. In God's world book, in God's world book, it testifies, it speaks loudly, it shouts to us. There is a God, the psalmist said, it was all created by the breath of God. Second, I want you to see that God has revealed himself in his word and stay in Psalm 19. Look at verse seven. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. God revealed himself in nature and God has revealed himself in his word. We wouldn't know what we're talking about except God gave us this book, would we? Where'd this book come from? Who wrote this book? Well, Paul will tell us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That word inspiration is that same word in Psalm 33, God breathed. Aha, get the connection. God breathed. And all was created. God breathed. And his word was spoken. And it was spoken to men who wrote it down so you and I can read it today. These words are written in the events of human history and played out in the events of human history. Some have said, well, maybe God didn't write that. Maybe just a good man wrote it. And so a good man wrote it knowing what he was going to write was going to be a fraud. Good men don't write and claim it's good and be frauds. We call them liars. Someone said, well, maybe an evil man wrote it. An evil man's not going to write this book and put Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1. Wine is a strong marker, uh, a mocker, and a strong drink is a brawler, and everybody goes to it as a fool. He's not going to write that condemning himself. Well, maybe somebody didn't know it wrote it. Listen, skeptics don't write prophecy. Skept- skeptics aren't going to write about Cyrus 150 years before he's born and say he's the dude that's going set to set the children of Israel back to their, back to their homeland. Skeptics won't do that. Peter will say that this this revelation is of no private interpretation. And he's not talking about, okay, Jimmy interprets it one way, Jordan another way, and I another way. What he's saying is, it did not originate from man. It originated from God. God's word book is his revelation to us that testifies that he is When we read his book, we learn, as he will continue to say in verse 8, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold. Yea, than much fine gold, sweeter than honey in the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. And in keeping them, there's great reward. Where do we learn about that? We learn about that in God's word book. Third, turn with Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. In Romans chapter 2, in verses 14 and 15. Romans chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. It says, For when the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are law to themselves who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness between themselves, their thoughts accusing or excusing them. God reveals himself in our conscience. Mike had some things to say about that a while ago. Wonderful things. God reveals himself in our conscience. Our conscience is that mental or moral moral faculty, that moral faculty that, that, that either accuses us, pricks us, or compliments, that is, recommends us. But that moral and mental faculty is neutral until it's educated. When a child is born, it's born, it's born, born neutral until it's educated. But it can only be educated properly by being educated by the Word of God. But even while it's born neutral per information, 
even within that mental and moral faculty, there is an inherent sense of right and wrong. Ah, but today, we're challenged that there's no absolute right, there's no absolute wrong. Whatever you think is right is right. Whatever I think is wrong is wrong. Well, when Noah went about preaching, Peter will say in 2 Peter chapter 2, he was a preacher of righteousness. Right wiseness, and if there's a preacher of right wiseness, there's a right and there's a wrong and there's a standard. And by his preaching, he condemned the world. Why? Because there was a standard that appealed to the mental and moral faculty of man. And when that mental and moral faculty of man is attuned and trained by the information of God, then that mental and moral faculty is all the more sharp, all the more intense with regard to accusing or excusing. But there is within man a right or wrong. But that sense of right or wrong can be skewed. It can be turned upside down to where like in the days of Isaiah, they call good evil and evil good. We get the two confused. That's why when it is trained by God's word, we can turn it on its head. But when it's trained by God's word, the conscience is a revelation of God. But then finally, as you turn to Hebrews chapter one, Hebrews chapter one, I want you to see God's final revelation is in his son. In Hebrews chapter one, verses one and two, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the Father by the prophets. Notice, hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Do you remember when the disciples were with Jesus and they said, show us the Father? He said, have I been with you so long that you've not seen the Father? What did he come to do? He came, as Paul was saying, Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, to declare the fullness of the Godhead bodily. What that simply means is at times you see attributes of the Father, at times you see attributes of the Spirit, and at times you see attributes of the Son. He came to fulfill, to, 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 uh, to reveal the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Look in Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, verse 15. Galatians chapter 1, verse 15. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb, and call me through his grace to reveal his son in me. Do you see that? Why? That I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. What was revealed to Paul? What was revealed to Paul was the revelation of the Son of God. The Son himself was revealed to Paul. When Jesus came, he is the final revelation. And that final revelation came to seek and to save the lost. He came to teach the lost. He came to appeal the lost. He came to show the lost how much he loves them. But not only that, he came also to break the shackles of sin that bind man in his own habits. He came to transform men. He came to cleanse men. And he came to transform men. The ultimate act of grace is not in creation by man, but the ultimate act of grace is in the revelation of his son. And the revelation of his son, the revelation of the conscience, the revelation of the word, and the revelation of the world world book all declare the glory of God. But it's that final revelation, it's the revelation of his son that shows us how, how we can be saved and be with the father. The word book will give us the information, but the son book, the revelation of the son shows us the sacrifice and the immense love. You see, we see God in his revelation of his world, of man, of his word, in our conscience, and in his son. And his son is appealing to me and you today. If we have left, come home. I've come to show you not just the Father. I've come to open the door for you so you can return to the Father. And the Father through me has reached down to you to enable you to have a hand that will lead you home. And that's why we'll say, come to me. 
And he's made that provision through his grace, moved by faith. Accept him as the Christ and put him on in baptism to be ever sins washed away. Yes, God has revealed himself to us and left us without excuse. If there's something we can do to help you this morning, those that are here with us, I'm going to ask you to come in just a moment for those who are still joining us via the stream. If there's something we can do, then please reach out to us. We just want to help. Come while we stand and while we sing.